Welcome into the Husker 24-7 podcast. I'm Michael Brunts. Brian Christofferson over there. Mike Schaefer will join us next week, next next pod. Um, he, he's got uh, got his hands full with the new kids, so uh, he, he's, he's taking today off. Lots to discuss today, Brian. Uh, mm -hmm. We got an extended viewing period yesterday. We actually saw a little bit of 11-on-11 11 11 football and not just stretching. We'll come out with, uh, I don't think, hot takes, but some interesting observations from that little viewing period. We're also at the midpoint of spring ball, more or less, so we'll very quickly run through a few questions and, and things that we still need to get answered over the, the, the back half of spring ball here. And in the second segment, we'll talk Nebraska basketball's new transfer edition, uh, some more visitors coming through town and also Nebraska baseball looking to kind of right the ship after a rough night. In so all that said, let's start with football, Brian. We, we saw 11 on 11. We got a little bit of three quarterbacks leading their offense we'll start with the lazy radio guy question what did you take away from that that, that uh that 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 viewing period that we saw yeah there'll be no hot takes here uh, it seems like daniel kalen will be the starting quarterback based off of what we saw yes um, he, uh, he he threw a couple dimes danny dimes was danny was dimes dialed in yeah uh, and I'm not saying that to uh, to uh, besmirch the work of uh, D Daniel yesterday. I, I, he did look good in the a little part we saw, uh, which I actually think is good. You know that the media happened to be in there when uh, Kalen sort of had like a nice moment. You know where it kind of reinforces like, hey, this is a competition. Let's let this thing play out. Um, you know, not just hand it to somebody um, through our. Uh, you know, discourse like in how we're talking about it on these podcasts and the radio stations and all that. Um, so I thought Kalen, he threw like a 30, 35 yard pass that Ja'Cory Barney made a nice play on. I think Barney, you would have to say, is one of those freshmen who's had a nice start to his spring from what we've seen and heard. And then he hit uh, Isaiah Nair for a nice little touchdown on his drive. Basically, what we saw is each possession started each scholarship quarterback had a possession that started inside their own 30 yard line, about 70 yards to traverse. And, um, Daniels, uh, had a nice drive. Harburg did a couple nice things while he was out there. Um, Ryla's particular drive we saw wasn't, um, a high completion rate. Um, but the thing I will say about Ryla and this, this stands out to me, Bruns, I don't know if you have the same takeaway, so I'm curious. Mm -hmm. When he throws the ball, I'm really impressed with like his like footwork. And I'm not trying to act like I'm a, like, <laughs> you know, some professor of quarterbacking here. I use it at Trent Dilfer. Yeah. But he does have like sort of a polished setup before he lets go of the ball, I think. And I know he's not a runner runner in the sense of like, you know, some quarterbacks we've seen around here, but I think he's got good pocket feet, you know, like in, in what he needs to do to set himself up to make throws and get that zip on the ball. So even though, you know, that particular station didn't go as well. Um, I like that look. And I also like the look of Jalen Lloyd, who he connected with on one play. And I just think, you know, you keep your ear to the ground. You keep hearing about Jalen Lloyd. He obviously had the explosives last year. Uh, but whenever I see him on the field, he sort of got that bounce and a, a bit of electricity to him that I like. So um, Jalen Lloyd was probably one of those guys who kind of popped out to me, him and Barney, as far as young receivers go. Yeah, I I mean, not to completely agree with everything you said there, um, but I, I agree. Uh, like the your, your point about Riola's pocket presence, I think that was noticeable and you know, Nebraska in that particular portion that we saw was mixing and matching the offensive line, I think, a lot more than I would have expected. Like yeah. the the people that you would have expected to be playing next to one another were not playing next to one another. And, you know, maybe that speaks to the depth that they have, but it felt like Dylan was having to deal with a collapsing pocket much more quickly than the other two quarterbacks. And mm -hmm. I thought he did a really nice job of 
not just kind of tucking tail and, and running and, and trying to, to get outside the pocket and, and do that stuff, but he moved well within the pocket and bought himself some time. It, the, the throws weren't there because uh, they were rushed, but I, I, I liked how he stood in there and at least gave the play a chance rather than just immediately bailing and trying to do something with his feet. I thought that was a really – kind of mature approach from a a freshman quarterback. I mean, obviously he's been coached by the best of the best for a long time, but there was just a feel there, I think, that that really stood out to me, even though the the passes weren't completed. Yeah, and your point's a good one about, you know, there's a lot of mixing and matching going there, uh, going on, and Rule said that on Saturday. He's like, you know, we're going to do that where we're going to put a QB where maybe you have the one O line in front of you and one station and things look pretty good for you, you know, and then, okay, now you got the three O line. Let's see what kind of quarterback you are. That was his exact quote. And in, in some cases though, this is a mixture as you were pointing out of like, maybe this guy's a starter. Maybe this guy's like, you know, second, third team playing together. And I think uh, this coaching staff is also wanting to challenge linemen in that way where um, I thought this was an interesting comment. Rule said Saturday, like the whole thing about like gelling, like on the O-line, basically like if you're the left guard that you need to be next to the left tackle, you're going to play with in the fall. He said as a farce, like that you need to have that. He, he, you know, you shouldn't need to be like next to Ben Scott to do your job or whatever. Like it, that, that shouldn't matter in the equation. So um, they've stayed consistent, I think, with that approach throughout the uh, spring where they've had these these stations where that it's uh, a little bit of everything kind of uh, put into the into the pot on the stove and see what happens and how certain guys respond to that situation, um, you know, playing next to different guys. And, and um, I think they like how they're, <laughs> you know, what it allows them to do from an evaluation standpoint with certain players. So. Yeah, it was it was cool though that I, I give a tip of the cap to uh, to rule uh, that when we rolled in there as media, they had that that drill going the eleven on eleven, and um, I don't think anybody's made a bigger deal of it than it is. It's just like you know, it, it was nice that you saw Kalen hit a couple passes, and I I think I like Danny's like mentality. Like you know, last week he came in and he was asked a question about like being the underdog you know, sort of, or how he's maybe perceived as the underdog on the outside looking in. And, you know, he gave an answer you'd kind of expect from a competitor where it's like, I don't really accept that premise. It's not, that's not the way I view this thing. And so um, it, it's cool to see him like, you know, he's got his dukes up and he's ready to fight just like uh, Dylan is. Yeah. Going back to the offensive line kind of movement and, and rotation, I, I did think it was interesting that you had, I think it was what they were calling the ones. And I, I think it was probably just for that day, but you had w- what I would have assumed would have been your two offensive tackle, your second team offensive tackles of Gunnar Gatula and Jacob hood was out there mm-hmm. on, on the right side with that group. Um, and on the interior, you had Mazuka on the left side, you had Lutovsky on the right side and Justin Evans um, dropped the Jenkins. Now, I guess, according to the roster, Yep. Um, at, at center, and then the the what what the next group coming in was it was Prohaska. Uh, I didn't see the guards who were in that group, um, but Ben Scott was there as well with Bryce Benhart on the right side. So I mean that just gives you an indication of you know how much they're mixing and matching. The fact that they can even mix and match at all. I mean that you think about last year this time, and it was a question of whether or not you were going to be able to get through the spring game because of the the number of offensive linemen that you had. And, you know, the, the question of like, you know, how, how many guys can you play? And it was, you know, probably legitimately like we, there's seven guys we feel like we could probably play right now. I think that that number is, is considerably higher as we stand here in mid April than it would have been this time last year, which I think is a credit to the way that they've rebuilt things and recruited. Yeah, no doubt. Um, you mentioned some names in there too on the old line, um, like Latovsky, Justin Evans. I could go to the other side of the ball. I'm I actually, I'm going to write something on this with like Malcolm Hartsog. I'm always intrigued by these, these guys in the spring brunts who are like 
third or fourth year guys who for we we have short attention spans, right? We kind of get sucked into like, okay, what's this freshman or redshirt freshman doing? It's our first time we laid eyes on them. And it always it often ends up coming back to like a Malcolm Hart talk or like Justin Evans. Like suddenly when you get to the game week, you're like, okay, they're first on the depth chart, actually. Let's see where this goes. And so just as we go through the spring and as we're talking through these guys, I always remind myself, like, don't get lost, you know, necessarily like you're impressed that this freshman is maybe doing this, but let's not forget about this third or fourth year guy who's an old name around here that is suddenly going to have a bigger role than he even had last year. And like, what, how is he progressing with that? Yeah, no, for sure. It, it's, it, you, you are kind of, you're drawn to the Ja'Cory Barney, the, the, the shiny new toy. Yes. Um, yeah. and, and, and the and for fair reason, but Jamal Banks. Yeah. Uh, w- one last thing on, on Tuesday's practice, you, you had special team, you, you had the special teams portion of the press conference. You get Ed Foley in there, Brian Buscini, Tristan Alvano. Um, you, you wrote about Alvano's kind of growth. I mean, it, it, it was kind of a tough freshman year for him. I mean, let's be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, some growing pains there. But do you get the sense that that w- – when you're talking about like, okay, going from five to like seven wins, obviously quarterback play is going to be huge in that and, and, you know, playmakers on offense. But – like that group that talked yesterday, if you just get a little bit more out of Alvano and Buscini, yep, that's that's such a huge key that I I, I think kind of gets lost in the the shiny new toys of everything. Is like if if those those two guys are good, Nebraska's got a chance to be okay. I think next season, and I, I like I know it's not the sexy topic, but. You, you kind of want to know how Alvano's banging it through the pipes in the spring just to know if, if things mm-hmm. are going to you know, look a little bit better in the fall. I mean, they do have um, their documentary or whatever you want to call it. They're filming that's called, what, Chasing Three. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're chasing those three or four points. So I'm just confirming what you're saying. Um, Alvano uh, was 9 of 15 last year. Uh, four of seven inside Memorial Stadium. Um, it started off choppy. He kind of had a nice stretch there in the middle, you know, Bronze, where it felt like things were on track. This is the, if you want an example, though, like one specific kick of like how pressure packed that job is and the narrative, how it flips. I would, because when I was writing the story, I was looking at how do you actually kick inside a Memorial Stadium? And he was four of seven. So he only got seven attempts. He actually missed his first two. Mm-hmm. And then he hit four in a row. He hit one earlier in the game against Iowa, but he had that like 44 yarder with like four minutes left or so. And if he makes that kick, he had hit his last five inside his home stadium. He hits maybe the game winner and is connecting to the point you're talking about where maybe Nebraska wins that game by three points instead of loses it by three. And the whole discussion's a little bit different, you know, like his, his percentage is 67 instead of 60. And he hit the last one against Iowa and who knows what happened in a bowl game then and all that stuff. And so I was just thinking about like, man, like one kick like that can shift everything just confidence wise, how we talk about a player. Um, And he's, he's an interesting case because, as great as Husker kickers have been in the past here with your Henry's, your Chris Brown's, your Brett Mars, you go through the list, Sam cook as a punter. Um, none of those guys. And I, you can say this without hesitating at all. None of them had the hype or whatever before they even set foot in a college classroom that Alvano did. They were all guys who like came like a year or so in, you're like, okay, yeah, that guy's really good. And then he became Mm -hmm. a rock star. Um, like Henry did. Uh, but not initially, not like where we're doing like super sixes, which we didn't do back then. But, you know, if they had like they wanna, those guys wouldn't have been on the list like Alvano was and stuff like right. that. Yeah. So he, he, he did enter a different space than any kicker we've ever seen before. I liked his mentality up front. He's a confident guy and he expects he's going to have success moving forward. Um, he's worked hard on his like pre-kick process and just having it be consistent all the time. He's worked a lot with Chris Brown and he's used a network of former great Husker kickers to like help him along with Ed Foley and Ed Foley has used those guys as sounding boards. So 
I think they're doing all the right things, but you nailed it. Him and Bushini being two notches better. That's two or three wins. Maybe, you know, like when you're talking about how close these games are probably going to be. Yeah. I mean, when you're, when you're talking, especially when you have a good defense, I mean, th- then the question becomes field position. Because I think if you can win the field position battle with a good defense, I mean, you're, you're kind of playing with house money at that point. And I going back to Alvano, I mean, I, I think he was probably the expectations around him. He was almost kind of a victim of, in some ways of how, how shaky Nebraska has been at the kicker spot for the last few years. I mean, mm-hmm. we're not that far away removed from Nebraska's best kicker being taken out of the, the dining room at, um, at lead belly and, and yeah. showing up and, and having to kick field goals. So I think there was a lot of expectations and, and certainly his performance in the state championship game heightened those, but you know, he, he's, you know, th- th- he, he's got to be better. I mean, Bushini, you know, was good, but there were also times where he needed a good punt from him and you didn't get it. So it, it was, it was kind of interesting to hear from those guys. And it, it's, it's one of those things though, where, you, 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 we won't know until August, you know, it, it, it looks good now, but you know, when, when the lights come on, that's, that's when we'll really know. There's definitely an understanding over there of how it all plays together though. You're talking about the special teams portion. And then I go back to like Terrence Knight in a few days before that uh, talking about the defense and like, he's had that quote where he's like, yeah, we were pretty good when our backs were to the wall and he was making a point that they've got to get more three and outs, you know, and they've got to, mm-hmm. they've got to do that part where if you're going to be a great defense, you're actually shifting the field where whoever your court young quarterback is, that's out there um, has 55 yards to go instead of 70, you know, yep. stuff like that. And um, so it all, it all links together, um, you know, complementing the other side. Um, but yeah, the, the, you, you nailed it. Those two guys, like it, they, they, that's exactly right. It's one of those days where Bushini and Alvano come in for the press conference. You're kind of like, oh, this isn't as like heavyweight, you know, as as some right. other ones. And then you think about it, you're like, actually, it is, you know, yeah. like as far as what it it matters. Yeah. Well, so we're at the midpoint of essentially midpoint. They finished up practice number seven on Tuesday. Of practice number eight's tomorrow on Thursday. On offense. What do you still need to? What do you feel like you still need to hear or still need to learn over these these next couple of weeks and with the spring game to kind of get a better sense of what that that side of the ball is going to look like? I'll even uh, let you. I'll even let you say quarterbacks if you want to. I don't think you will though. No, I won't. I I don't have a good concept of what is happening at running back, and I'm not even saying that in a negative way. Like I think it's bad. I don't know. I don't know exactly where Dowdell's at in the conversation. Um, you know, I know he's having to learn things and he's probably going through it a bit, swimming in it as a was a popular phrase back in the day. Um, but you know, Emmett Johnson, like is is he in these scrimmages that are ahead, is he gonna be that guy who kind of shows like we didn't see like his ceiling last year? We just saw like a tease of what he can be. Um, so running back definitely is really intriguing to me, even though Gabe Irvin's not out there right now, Ramirez is kind of out there there. He, uh, rule said he could basically be full go, but he's being careful with them. But on Saturday, there's going to be a scrimmage the next Saturday after that, then the red white game. I mean, these are going to be the, th- the three practices where I really am listening closely. And we haven't talked to EJ Barthel up front, which is probably good for us because, I think some time is needed and let him give like some maybe hopefully candid thoughts on where some guys are at. That's really interesting to me. Like what comes out of the scrimmages as far as the backs and how they performed when there's contact, bring them to the ground. Who's the guy who can get the extra three yards. You even heard Maurice Mazuka's name pop up as a walk on that was doing some things. So is that a real story or just a spring, you know, flash, you know, you got to figure that sort of stuff out. Do you get concerned whenever you get a lot of running backs mentioned? Like when you get like seven or eight guys mentioned, like that that position more than than others to me, if you start hearing a ton of guys, it's like, well, that, that might not be a good thing. 
it gets a little nervous. Part of it's because of those injuries and yeah. Ramir being limited, but that's a big thing of it. You know, like if, if you were told right now, Gabe and Ramir were going to have a full season of good health and whatever mm-hmm. Emmett or Dowdell or whomever stacks up with that, you'd feel pretty good about the position. Like you'd say, okay, they can get some stuff done with that crew. But I think that's the big, if that, you know, worries people, not that they don't think Gabe can play or whatever. It's just like, they need to see that full season where he, what, what's that look like? Can he, can he have a full run at it? Um, can Ramir, who's kind of had those injuries pop up here and there, have a break where he, he gets, you know, a full year. What's that, what's that picture like? Um, I hope we see it for those guys' sake. And also, I think the running back room is fine if if that were the case. But that's the question. Like, you, you got to be available for it to matter. On defense, going to that side of the ball, what what, what do you need to hear? It, it feels like we know so much more about that side of the ball. But what do you, what do you need to hear or see over the next two, three weeks? I don't know that it's going to come out the next two or three weeks, but I'm curious by the time we get to the red white game. Um, when we see the cornerbacks trot out there, who's like, if they play the ones together, maybe they won't, but like who's opposite Tommy Hill, like who, you know, is, is that Bly Hill? Is it Jeremiah Charles? Is it somebody, you know, somebody else, uh, Dwight Boodles in back there, Ethan nation. I, there's like five guys that are interesting there. And so I'm really curious, like who's going to win the other corner spot. And it's going to be a fun story off the bat, no matter who it is, because I think it's going to be somebody who's got like some juice behind their name for various reasons, whether it's a, a Bly Hill or Jeremiah Charles or whatever. And there's going to be a lot of intrigue around them. And also you might feel like you've got decent fallbacks, right? Like you've, if you, even if one of the guys gets his first crack at it and things go a little haywire, maybe you feel like you've got four guys now, like where, okay, next guy gets his shot and, and it, it can, uh, you have a little bit of a safety net there, but that's really interesting to me how that works out on the back end. I suppose you'd say the same about middle backer, you know, um, Bullock obviously is going to be important. Um, Javen Wright, you know, like what does his role look like in Mackay Bear? Um, Javen Wright's probably a guy, as I'm talking through this, Bronze, that like I think is going to be huge to the if this defense goes from good to great, like he's the kind of player I think about. And yet, you know, we haven't heard we don't talk as much about him. He hasn't been up front yet. So when I, I just think he's gonna be a guy that people don't ever forget about him being in the picture and like what he could matter as far as just his skill set. All right. One more on the, the kind of midpoint. Um, so as, as you know, you, you start tallying up the scores from the front side, you're thinking about maybe getting a hot dog up, up in the, the snack bar and heading back out for number 10. I got a question before you ask that question. How do you do as a golfer? Do you, perform well on the 10th usually after a stop at the turn or do you perform worse because i see both it go both ways with people um it it's uh it kind of clears the mind a little bit you get like the the slate wiped clean you can kind of forget about that three putt the three putt eight you took on number nine and and you you get refocused you get get a little you, you know what's great the, the the Snickers bar and if the mm-hmm. club the course that you go to if they they keep them cold that's that's where mm. that's where you're living right there um, so you get the cold Snickers bar you head for ten you're feeling okay about life just a little pause um, get the anger out how about you I I, I I generally can dial it in for ten and then 11's anybody's guess I usually play a poor tenth hole I would say if you averaged them out um yeah i have like uh ketchup on my golf glove and stuff it's just it, it you have a deal where the i'm like the the hot dog's like riding as like a shotgun passenger next to me you know and it like occasionally has fallen off you yep. know d- down onto the f- dirty floor and you're like yeah it's it's fine and you eat it still <laughs> so yeah it usually it's not really graceful uh for me both in the cart and out of the cart on the 10th hole. 
Okay, that's good to we'll make note of that. Anyway, back to your question. Yeah, so who threw you, – you can take this question any way that you want, whether it's somebody that's just like front of mind, somebody that's like really just kind of surprised you with how they looked or how – you know, what you're hearing about them. Who is the BC MVP of the first half of spring ball to this point for you? MVP. Oh, that's a good question. It was. Thank you. It's a lot of, you could go so many different ways with it. Yeah. It's, but you know what I'm going to say? I think it's a, it's like uh, the Seinfeld where they have to split the bicycle um, where Newman is the judge and he's like, mm-hmm. and um, he ends up giving it to Kramer because um, he was going to give it away. Anyway, um, I would say they need to split the bicycle award here and give okay. it I, on my MVP. And this is contributing to the hype, but Ryle and Kalen, I think it's the most important spot. Everybody wondered how it was going to go. And, from what I've heard, they're on pace at least, if not a little bit ahead of where they thought they would be. That's not to say like it's all figured out and there's not some throws where you're like, well, what was that? You know, but um, if you listen to Rule on Saturday, um, he said they're at an accelerated pace, probably of even what I thought. And from what I've heard that they've they have done pretty well and made some throws that have impressed older guys and stuff like that and i there's going to be growing pains we all know that blah 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 but i think they've they've hit they got out of the blocks well you know like and and i think the fact that danny's here and showing like i'm part of this competition too and the other guy sees this player do something and he's like okay all right i saw what you did there now it's my turn and i think that's the biggest thing where they can help each other they don't have to like help all the stuff in the film room, whatever gets said or going golfing together, that's fine. But I think just seeing another person like do something well or how he adjusted something and then they get a chance to translate that to their game is a big part of it. So I'd say the QBs being um, on pace or a little ahead of pace is the biggest storyline because of where they play and, and how much attention's on them. And so I'll give them the MVP because where else am I going to go? I mean, you could say Nash. What would you say, though? Um, that's, that's a good one. Um, I, I asked this question hoping that I wouldn't have to answer it. Um, I, I would, it's so tough to just give it to one person. I would say, I, I, I would say Nash Hummacher. I would, I would go with Nash. And I would say, I say this because you've got a guy who, you know, was wrestling in the NCAA tournament and then a week later is out doing football drills and, you know, wants to be out there. I think he's going to, I don't think he's going to have any trouble putting enough weight back on. I think he's going to be fine by the time the season starts. And I think that he is the key to that defense Mm -hmm. because he was so good last year. And I think there is more, there's still more room to the ceiling for him. And I'll go, I'll go with him um, because I think the, the defense is going to have to carry things early on. And I I think he's going to be such a huge part of what that defense is going to do and make things easier for guys like I Robinson and other guys up front. I I, I just, I'll go with him. Yeah. I like that answer too. And, it's interesting because I don't even know how many rep, <clears throat> reps he's compiling over there, honestly, because they're kind of, uh, you know, trying to limit them a little bit. But I think the f- what you said, the fact that he popped back in and sort of the message that sends of urgency and like you hear like him and Terrence Knight and like rule laughed about it, like they he, they got into it a little bit on Saturday, like because he wanted to go out there. And mm-hmm. I'm sure T. Knighton's like, no, you're not supposed to be out there. Um, that stuff's good like you you love that um sort of what that brings and how other guys on the team process that so i think that's a good pick all right we'll take a quick break when we get back we're going to talk about nebraska's nebraska basketball's revolving transfer door suddenly going the other way yep talk about that in a minute 
All right, Nebraska basketball after losing several transfers, mostly expected, maybe a surprise too, um, a little surprise or two, picked up their first edition out of the portal this week uh, on Monday. Andrew Morgan out of North Dakota State uh, committed to Nebraska over pretty strong interest in Minnesota. Uh, Is that fair to say? Definitely. We'll give Nebraska a nice little post presence. Uh, what what can you tell us about him? You talked to him after he committed, um, and, and we're exchanging messages throughout the very hurried trip to Lincoln that he made. But what do you make of this addition and, and what he could possibly mean for a, I guess, somewhat quickly growing Nebraska basketball roster? I always try to look at it as what are the guys who like run the system actually? like Who are they – putting at the top of their board because they see a fit that what the fit they see is what matters. Not what, what I see about, Oh, this guy had this many points or rebounds at this place. It's more like them seeing like, no, his game works within our system. And the fact that Hoiberg, uh, we know this now um, confirmed through Andrew Morgan on Monday night, that first Monday night when that Hoiberg was sort of on the road and people are tracking a plane and all that stuff. Uh, I think that everybody that's out there, um, you know, he was in Fargo that Monday night to get it going. And the fact that that was like an initial stop in the process and that nearby Minnesota, which was his home state school, um, really wanted him. And I think at one point uh, talking to their people thought they had him. Um, it, it, it says a lot about how Nebraska valued him as a 6'10 guy who, um, you know, he's, he can shoot the three some, and, uh, he can just be that maybe kind of rink mass type guy, you know, and we're still waiting on rink, by the way, we don't know exactly how that's going to go. He had the knee issues and he, it's been talked about how there might be a surgery afterward. And, you know, obviously he has pro options and all that stuff. So, um, I think whether, whatever rink decides to do, there's a lot of use for Andrew Morgan as a guy who averaged, you know, 12 points, five rebounds, had an assist per game. That number will go up in Nebraska's offense. Um, and just another one of those guys who started 59 games, has played a lot of college basketball. It, it fits into that, you know, sort of uh, that formula that this staff has established that has been pretty useful in past off seasons. I was going to say, he profiles closely to what Nebraska basketball and its better portal iteration has sought out of the portal. Mm-hmm. Yep. Like, yeah, definitely. Go ahead. I, that, that was, there was a, I should have raised my voice at the end of that to signify a question, but that, that, I mean, this is, this is what they've looked for is experience and certainly offensive fit. He fits in, into their uh, system. No, you could have done like them. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I think I think so. Um, it's one of the, these are funny because it's like I've never seen it. I've seen his clips now. Yeah, I never saw Andrew Morgan did, did play you know basketball. Who he was two weeks ago before <laughs> no. we were tracking that yeah. plane to Fargo. So, so this reminds me very much, and I just like to keep it real sometimes. Like it's like when <laughs> there's like an athletic director search or something, or like a search for a wide receivers coach. Like nobody knew who Keith Williams was back in the day, like when he, you know, got brought in or like Troy Dan and it's like, oh yeah, Troy Dan. And like, now we know all about him and all this stuff. Yep. I feel that way with some of the portal guys, but I do see how his profile like fits into what they want. And I, I, they've done well at picking their guys lately. So I give a little bit of a, a trust factor to them that when they highlight specific guys and like have a sort of, this is the one we're going to see first. I like, I put some emphasis on that in my mind. Like he must really have stuff that they like. Um, You love his length. Um, And, you know, that's the thing when you look at the guys they've brought in from the portal, all of them are long guy. They've just got, they've always got these guys lately who have just really long and, and uh, can space the floor really well. And that's the thing, Andrew, I had an interview with them the other day. Um, He talked about that spacing, Uh, in Fred's offense and just how he thinks he can really, um, you know, play off of that um, and succeed. 
and he knows Nebraska has momentum. He's excited to be a part of it. He fell in love with the campus. Um, I think he knew right after his visit here or on his drive back, it processed to him like that's the place. I, it's a tough decision between my home state and Nebraska, but my gut is with Nebraska. And it says something that the Huskers won this standoff. Maybe NIL helped a little bit. I don't know, but I think a lot of other things did as well in, in making sure they got it. So Nebraska continues to – where are we at scholarship count-wise? That's right, Nick, six left, is that right? Yeah, if everybody that's on the team says they're back, we know Bryce and Jawan are coming back, of course, but if everybody stays with that, they have seven of the 13 right now. Okay. There's going to be some Big Ten flavor, though, to some of the new targets coming in. Can you, Possibly, can you yes. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, we do know that – Okay, on that Monday night, he saw Morgan, you know, a week or two or whatever it was ago. And then on the Tuesday morning, he was in Minneapolis. And this isn't just plain watching. We've figured it out that he, you know, talked with, he visited with Farrell Payne and Joshua Ola Joseph. Um, Payne is definitely a real interesting guy if you were able to, you know, get in that sweepstakes and win it. Um, so there's possible visits, I think with those guys, we'll see how that transpires. You got to remember they've got William Kyle, uh, the third who, you know, has visited and Frankie Fiddler who's visited and Nebraska's on their short list. And so if they could land one or both of those in state guys, you're starting to feel really good about things. And then we also know, um, that they do have Gavin Griff Griffiths coming in from, um, Rutgers. Uh, who was really a top recruit a cycle ago. He kind of had an off year shooting it where he's only like 28% from deep, but he's got a good stroke and is really thought to be a shooter. He's six, eight got length. I like him. Like I, I, I think he could really fit well in their system. And so I know his first year, there were some ups and downs and all that, but I think he could definitely be a guy that would work well and like what Fred does. And uh, you could see his shooting start to take off. He's kind of the same thing, like six, eight, six, seven, six, eight on the perimeter, yeah. right? Yep. Six, eight guy. Um, you know, obviously you're trying to find those, the shooters to make up for case and, and Wilcher being gone. Um, and I think Griffiths could fill sort of that Wilcher role at least, you know, or like kind of like as far as giving you some punch from the outside and he actually gives you more length and, and things like that. Um, as far as his defensive profile, I can't claim to be an expert on all that. Like, <laughs> you know, but um, I, I like, I like him as a target. I really do. When I first saw his name out there, even before Nebraska was like mentioned with him, I remembered him as a recruit and I knew like he didn't have like a huge year at Rutgers, but what he did do Bruns is he had like his first game at Rutgers. He scored like 25 points or something like that. And he had a, these occasional outbursts. And I always think there's a lot of guys who never have even a game like that in their college career. You know what I mean? Like where they get above 15 points or have a night where mm -hmm. they go for 25. I don't care if they're playing, you know, the, 230th ranked team in the country they still don't have it so the fact that he's he has at least done a little of that and you think about his recruiting background i think he's a good target so we'll see what happens there last question on basketball how how strongly do you think that they're going to be pursuing point the point guard spot in the portal <clears throat> um i think you definitely you definitely uh you keep pushing there and see if, if, if the right fit uh, comes to the surface, Aaron Uless, um is expected to return, or at least Fred has always talked about him being available this next year. That's always been kind of a different situation, of course, with what happened. So it's, I think people kind of talk around it if we're honest a lot of the time, yeah. but yeah. we're now to that point where, um, it matters like if he's available and the, it sounds or Fred has always talked like he could be. Um, and that was a guy who he was going to be the point guard last year. Like he really remember that. And then that, that thing happened while they were on the trip to Spain and they had to go get Boogie Coleman, who was a good teammate, but didn't really take off on the floor. Uh, but Ulysses is a guy who started a lot of games at Iowa, been on NCAA tournament teams. I think that would be, 
um, huge if 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 he can play and sort of be who you hope. But I, I think you always just keep your eyes open if there's another way to add depth or or bolster that competition for sure. And obviously, it helped that Bryce. I even though he's not a traditional point guard, mm -hmm. it did. He does have a composure about him um, and confidence. I think that developed over time that he can handle the ball and get you in spots you need to be. Um, maybe not all the time, like you don't want him to be that guy, but enough that you can, if you have Ulysses and him and, and you can use your bigs at time to bring it up, um, you can probably work through it pretty well. But I do know there isn't a kind of that want or that wish of Husker fans to have that like true, like what would this look like if you had like that true, like dynamic point guard that, that, you know, to go with what they had last year, that, that might be a game changer. Yeah. All right. Um, you want to hit on a little bit of Husker baseball before yeah. we get out of here. So Nebraska baseball last weekend um, took two or three from Ohio state. Brett Sears again, just dominant with a uh, complete game shutout, gave up two hits. One was a swinging bunt. The other was kind of a flare uh, dying quail into right field faced one above the minimum and was just uh just spectacular. I mean, I, I, I hope that Nebraska fans can appreciate the, the start to the season that he's had because he's like on, on like a historic type track right now mm. for where he's at. Um, so they won Friday, won Saturday, lost kind of a stinker on Sunday, fell behind early, weren't able to do much, um, you know, down the stretch offensively. And then last night in Lawrence, lost 13 to 11 to Kansas and just kind of a ugly game where, you know, you're, you're midweek, you're, you're trying to rely on guys or get, get outs with guys that are not your typical weekend guys. Um, some tough, tough outings for guys like Jackson Brockett, Ty Horn had a great first inning and then struggled after that. And, you know, Nebraska has the tying run at the, at, at second base with one out in the ninth and you feel like maybe they could pull it out, but, you know, second baseman makes a nice play, turns a double play, and, and that's the ball game. So where things stand for Nebraska now, 22 and 8, um, 5 and 1 in Big Ten play. They travel to Rutgers for three games this weekend. Rutgers has some pitchers. They they can they can definitely play. Um, and and this kind of starts this, I would say like 10 to 12 game stretch for Nebraska that's basically going to decide. The direction of their season if they come out and play pretty well in these 10 to 12 games um you know you, you're going to be feeling pretty good about where the ncaa tournament possibilities are at the start of may if they struggle here you, you're going to be on that bubble and uh there's going to be some tense times in may so kind of at a, a, a tipping point here in the season and they, they got to kind of get things turned around they haven't they haven't really had to face much adversity in terms of losses this season and uh, they're going to have to do that on the road against Rutgers. Is there a, is there like a Lunardi or Torvik of baseball um, that you like look at where you're like right now, this is where they're kind of where they're guessing is somewhat in line with how it ends up. Or is that, is it even too early for that sort of talk? You just said like these next 12 games. So I, I take that into my head as I ask yeah. that, but. No, it's fair. It's you're at the midpoint of the season, so you're you're starting to get the NCAA tournament projections. Nebraska is solidly in in pretty much every projection as of now. D1 baseball last week had them as a potential host. This week they were they were not um, after losing to Ohio State. Those those tend to pretty closely follow RPI, so you know you, you have a pretty good idea of where things stand. But you know for for Nebraska, th these are their you know, kind of top opponents that they have left on the roster or on the schedule this season. Um, it's Rutgers. You've got Maryland. You've got Iowa coming in the the spring game weekend um, with some midweeks against K State, Kansas, and Creighton peppered in between there. So mm. um, it, it's going to be tough. Um, you know, especially the midweeks. I mean, they, they've got to get something figured out there, um, pitching wise, to give them a little bit of of depth in those games because. You know, you, you you can set things up as much as you want, but if your starter's exiting in the second inning, 
it's kind of tough to go to your high leverage guys in, in the third inning and expect sure. to have much success there. Yeah, and it, it is frustrating those midweek games because mm-hmm. obviously it bit them in the backside last year. Yep, and I know, I know you get you can't use up your arms before the conference weekend. Um, but you know how it is around here. There's that perception thing. Like it's like things are going good, 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 and then there was that yeah. like loss to Creighton, you know, and it it grinds people's gears to lose a Creighton yeah. in anything, you know. So um, it, I do hope they can find some of that depth. What what do they have like midweek left on the docket? Like what's what's still out there? Yeah, I think they've got they've got two left with Creighton. They've got. Kansas is going to come to to Lincoln later this month. They've got K State coming to Lincoln this month yet still, I believe. There's like a South Dakota State game peppered in there, um, but between things. And I, I try to think if there's anybody else. They they actually because they played so many four game series early in the season, they don't have a lot of weeks where they play a Tuesday Wednesday. So that's, um, that, that's actually kind of nice, but. Uh, it, it's going to be, you know, the, the midweeks that they, they scheduled more tough games in the midweek. And, you know, it, the, the margin for error is a little bit more thin when you're facing a K-State or a Kansas or something like that with with guys that can play. So, um, you know, the, the, I'll give you one thing to watch for this weekend and, and end on this. The Brass kind of had this thing where, you know, Caden Brumbaugh was hitting leadoff for them for a good chunk of the season. He injures his shoulder and is unable to play in the field. And so they've had to bat him at DH at times. They've had to leave him out of the lineup at times to, to get other guys in the lineup. They would love to be able to have Brumbaugh play somewhere in the field because then they could have Case Sanderson, who's their leading hitter mm-hmm. as a freshman, batting as the designated hitter. And it sounds like, Brumbaugh has been trending well to potentially get back on the field, they hope, um, against Rutgers. We'll see if that holds, uh, but that was at least where things were trending as of last week. So um, if they do that, they would have Brumbaugh batting leadoff more than likely. Then you can get Sanderson in the middle of the lineup, and you're a little bit more settled um, with, with what you have there. And Sanderson's been great. I mean, I, I, I it's unfortunate he hasn't been able to bat more because he, he's uh, – He's a, a a college freshman that hits like a college junior senior, just really a uh, mature approach. And you said uh, it's Iowa coming to town spring game weekend, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I got nice. uh, Iowa coming on spring game weekend. I'm expecting you'll have a lot of crowds out there. Um, Iowa's got Brody Brecht, a he of the uh, 101, uh, yeah. 102 mile an hour fastball. Uh, he's starting on Sundays now because he's kind of struggled this year. So that that should be a, a pretty tense series, I think, just based on kind of where both of these teams are are likely to be at that point. So that that's one to definitely circle on the docket. And, and they used to do this back when Nebraska was in the Big 12, I remember, where they'd have a Big 12 series the same weekend as the spring game. Mm-hmm. And you'd get like eight – you know, seven, 8,000 people that would get into the ballpark, just walk over from the spring game and, uh, you know, watch a little baseball too. So maybe you can benefit from that. We need a gift. We need one of those like 74 degree days, Mm -hmm. you know, just a slight breeze, this crappy wind. I used to not have as big a problem with the wind, but just like, yeah. It's it's an adverse. It's it's a foe now. It, it's a foe to Tristan Alva to bring it back home. It's a foe to Tristan Alvano and Brian Bushini in the kicking game, and it feels that way to me. Um, and so hopefully that's not there that weekend for uh, Nebraska Iowa. Yeah, so lots to look forward to over the next few weeks um, as spring ball wraps up, baseball ramps up, and the transfer portal for for basketball keeps rolling on. The football portal opens. Well, we're a couple like five days away, so yep, you get you get that uh, going on as well. So keep it locked on Husker twenty four seven. We'll have all of the portal news. We'll have spring ball news, baseball news, tons of analysis, recruiting. Nebraska has been really active with hosting visitors the last couple of weeks. To practices they're going to have a packed visit weekend for the red white game. So make sure 
You're locked in on Husker 24-7. For all of that, for Brian Christopherson, I'm Michael Brunts. We'll be back with you really soon with another episode of the Husker 24-7 podcast.